This video about the political and economic development of the Danube is sponsored by Crossout. Crossout is an online vehicle shooter game in which the vehicles are made by the player. The game is free to play on PC, Xbox and PlayStation. You need to just download it and can go ahead and play. Assemble together all sorts of cabin parts, wheels, weapons and more to create your own ideal combat vehicle or Mad Max style combat rig. The vehicle parts and weapons are also upgradable through collected resources and have unique in-game damage models. Chainsaws, drills, crossbows, railguns, rams, machine guns, to various different skins, the list of options is huge and varied to your liking. This means that no two players will turn up in the game with the same vehicle. It is easy to get into the game as a new player, you just download the game, plug together the vehicle and jump right into a game with other players. Game modes include fast all against all matches, racing matches and team matches, as well as an open world campaign that can also be played in a single player mode. Download the game with the link in the description and you will get free bonuses including a unique pixel paint, powerful cabin and selection of free weapons. Many thanks to Crossout for sponsoring this video. Why do Austria and Hungary keep pushing for EU membership of Serbia? You do not have to know much European history to know that historically they used to be mortal enemies barely a century ago. But today, Hungary and Austria are Serbia's best friends in the European Union, while Serbia's traditional Western European ally France is increasingly distancing herself from Serbia in favour of Croatia becoming France's best friend in the Balkans. A lot of this has to do with how much the European geopolitical environment changed. During the 19th century, Europe was still a continent of empires in which small states were gobbled up. Austria and France had for several centuries been rivals in gobbling up small states in the Low Countries, the Rhine Valley and Italy. When Austria gobbled up Hungary, it wanted to gobble up more lands in the east. There it faced the Ottomans, then the Russians and the Serbs. And because of this, the French formed a strategic alliance with the Serbs to contain Austria-Hungary. But Europe has long since left behind the age of imperialism. Geopolitical alliances of old no longer make any sense in the modern European political environment. In this new environment, European countries pursue new goals, often different from previous goals. The French have for decades and the cross-political parties had a dream of creating a European political bloc of Mediterranean nations that can stand on a footing equal with other European political blocs of Northern Europe and Eastern Europe. From selling cheap fighter jets to Greeks and the Spanish, cuddling the Italians, Spanish and Portuguese whenever they can, to trying to resolve Greek and Turkish disputes. French European policy has been heavily focused on getting the Mediterraneans to cooperate and integrate. In that context, Austria and Hungary are no longer a rival power but cute tourism destinations. The French sometimes lovingly refer to Austria as the old enemy. And Serbia is just boring now because it is landlocked. But Croatia, with its big, long, juicy Mediterranean coastline, is the most attractive place for the French in the Balkan neighborhood. France was among the first to recognize Croatian independence. Croatian troops are invited regularly to march on French parades. France heavily subsidized and supports the building and modernization of the Croatian military. France is one of the biggest investors in Croatia. France heavily encourages French tourism in Croatia. And France was the main driving force behind Croatian European Union and NATO membership. France is basically on a mission of tearing Croatia out of Balkan politics and squabbles to make them part of a Mediterranean political bloc. Somewhat ironic when you keep in mind that the two are fierce football rivals. But in the modern context of a post-imperial Europe of cooperation, it makes sense. It will be interesting to see if the French succeed with this project in the coming decades, and if just as we see Northern Europe and Eastern Europe as political blocs within Europe, we may also soon speak of the Mediterraneans as its own European political bloc. And it is exactly this type of political and economic set of calculations in a post-imperial Europe that is the reason why Hungary and Austria are so heavily invested in Serbia. And most of it revolves around a neglected river. I cross the Danube almost every day and let me tell you it is a huge river. I live in a part of Vienna called Floretsdorf, which is on the north bank of the Danube. And people in the southern parts of Vienna often like to make fun of those living here by calling this part of the city Transdanubia or Barbaria. This is because the river used to be the border between the Roman Empire and whatever lived north of it. 
The Danube has its origins in Germany, close to the Swiss and French border. It is 2,800 kilometers or 1,740 miles long. It flows through 10 countries into the Black Sea in Ukraine. Geographers like to divide the Danube into three segments. The Upper Danube in Central Europe from Germany to Slovakia, the Middle Danube in the Northern Balkans from Hungary to Serbia, and the Lower Danube in the Eastern Balkans from Romania to Ukraine. The Upper Danube is dominated by a fast-flowing river, often flowing through tight valleys. The Middle Danube is broad and slow-flowing and essential for irrigation in the large fertile fields of the Pannonian Basin. The Lower Danube is massive and flows through the fertile Valachian plains into the Black Sea. But the Danube's influence is not merely constrained to just the Danube River itself. If you look at the various tributaries, you end up with an enormous region of land that includes 19 different countries, which are all through this geography tied into the Danube. It is the second largest river of Europe, and up to a quarter of the European population lives within its sphere of influence, which is amplified by the fact that the Danube is navigable for transportation ships almost throughout its entire length, right up to the Bavarian town of Kelheim. Many of the Danube's tributaries, such as the Morava, Trava, Sava, Tisa and Prut, are also partially navigable. And it is here where within a historical context we see some of our geographical assumptions about rivers confirmed but also challenged. During antiquity, the Danube was a border. As geographic determinists will tell you, rivers are always great borders. Difficult to cross, they form ideal military defensive lines. But rivers are also the single best arteries for inland transportation that exist. Sure, trucks are great, trains are even better, but as anyone from the Mississippi Basin will tell you, nothing beats having a navigable river in your country as an artery for transportation. By the time the Habsburg Empire came to be, the role of the Danube was no longer as a border, but the core that kept the empire going. Without it, that empire would have never worked. Styrian steel, Hungarian grain, Austrian soldiers and tax collectors were shipped up and down the Danube and integrated everything into one system. This raises a question we asked in previous videos. Does geography shape society? Or is it how we as a society choose to interact and use geography that is more important? Nevertheless, the Danube certainly did its part in intermixing the various cultures along its riverbanks. From Hungarian goulash, to Bosnian burek, to Austrian schnitzel, to Slovak kraina, to Serbian shevapšići, to Romanian jumari, to Croatian stuffed peppers, to Bulgarian moussaka. I can walk 20 minutes from my apartment and will find them in supermarkets everywhere. And I am sure that this is just as much the case for any viewer from Budapest to Bratislava to Belgrade and co. In architectural style and even down to football culture, the geography of the Danube shaped this large region to share many commonalities, something the historian Simon Winder called Danubia. And Danubia lies at the center of why Hungary and Austria are so deeply invested into a Serbian integration in Europe. When the Austro-Hungarian Empire collapsed, the Danube became largely neglected. In the interwar period, national entities mainly squabbled over lands and resources. Hungary and Romania were far too busy bickering over who owned what than being able to commit to any sort of sharing zones of economic and cultural interest. After the Second World War, communism severely damaged the Danube through neglect. In Hungary, the Danube and its tributaries were used mainly to dump toxic industrial waste. Serbia and Croatia were part of Yugoslavia at the time. And although a sprawling industry managed to evolve around Belgrade, the Danube did not end up being used as a means of transportation infrastructure. It is often forgotten today that the Soviet Union was not very nice to Yugoslavia, especially under Tito. So Tito did little to integrate Yugoslavia into the Soviet Union. In that environment, the Danube was not much used to Yugoslavia as a means of transportation infrastructure. Belgrade manufactured probably the best machines of any communist country, but it could not sell and ship them down the Danube because there were no customers there. Instead, Yugoslavia developed the harbors of the Adriatic. In Romania, things were the worst. The worst mismanagement of the river by any country. Shipwrecks filled up the river and were not removed. Waste was dumped into it. And Ceausescu, the communist dictator of Romania, was so stupid he mobilized forced Romanian laborers to build a canal from the Danube to the Black Sea. Yes, you heard that right. The Danube is a river that flows into the Black Sea and Ceausescu wasted national resources to build a canal that connected the Danube to the Black Sea. 
something he did just to spite the Soviet Union because he did not want to pay transportation fees, even though he didn't really have much to transport in the first place. This neglect of the Danube throughout the Cold War, however, had a somewhat unintended side effect. The Danube Basin became a region of pristine natural beauty through large swathes of land being left to themselves, in particular in one place, the Danube Delta in Romania and Ukraine. And even though the Danube was neglected during the Cold War as a means of cultural and economic exchange, in one aspect it was not neglected as a means of generating electricity. Ironically, this began with a socialist government program in the only non-socialist country on the Danube. In the 1970s, this very conservative country, in a weird twist, elected the most far-left leader a democratic European country ever had. Austria wanted to be energy independent from Germany and Italy since the 1950s and had invested into hydropower ever since. Under Kreisky, this policy was doubled down upon, creating a huge network of hydroelectric dams on the Danube and its tributaries with the intention to provide and create a public state-owned electricity network. This policy was such a success that it was instantly copied by everyone else on the Danube. There's a question that is raised here about how we see and interpret geography. More specifically, I would argue that some aspects of geography are more a question of interpretation and use than just the physical reality itself. I would argue that the Balkans as a geographic entity is not a real thing actually grounded in any sort of geographical reality, but a political construct of the Ottoman Empire whose existence as a perceived entity was artificially prolonged throughout the Cold War. The concept of the Balkans only makes sense if you see it as a distinctive peninsula, but Europe is in itself a peninsula of peninsulas, so geographically that doesn't really make any sense. The Balkans themselves have no unifying geographic features. They are cut and sliced up by various mountain ranges and basins, and no underlying geographic feature unites any of this. I would argue that the Balkans is a pseudo-geographic and pseudo-cultural concept of dubious political origin that belongs into the trash can and should be replaced with better concepts. It makes far more sense, for example, to divide the Balkans into two regions. One of them can simply be referred to as the Central Mediterranean, a transitional point in the Mediterranean dominated by Greek and Turkish culture between the Italian-dominated Western Mediterranean and the Arab-dominated Eastern Mediterranean. And the other part is Central Danubia. A geographic entity that, despite almost a century of neglect, has proven far too beneficial as a means of exchange in culture and trade to just go away, and therefore lies at the heart of why Austria and Hungary are currently Serbia's best friends in Europe. They both dream of a revitalization of the region. The Danube, if fully developed, could become a core of European infrastructure, energy, industry, culture and trade that could rival the Rhine Valley. Vienna, Bratislava, Budapest, Belgrade and Bucharest could become centers of European industry and trade, and Romania's Black Sea ports could become the gates to one of Europe's largest economic centers. For all intents and purposes, many of Europe's landlocked countries could end up with access to the sea, and a part of Europe, long seen as isolated, distant and backward, could suddenly become a central part of Europe. Just as how the French dream of the Mediterranean as an integrated bloc in Europe, Austria and Hungary dream of the European Danubians as a political bloc in Europe. And the one thing standing in the way of this dream is Serbia. It isn't that Serbia itself is somehow an inherent obstacle, but the position in which Serbia is. For the Danube to be transformed into a European artery of trade and culture, transportation along its banks must be facilitated with as few obstacles as possible. This could be facilitated through EU membership, and Serbia is the last country the Danube crosses that is not an EU member. And getting Serbia into the EU will be difficult to say the very least. Hungary and Austria therefore face many challenges, like trying to get Serbia and Croatia to get along, which in the current state is an almost impossible task. Croatia, although a Danube country, inherited the Yugoslavian ports and prefers developing its Adriatic coastline and trying to tie itself deeper into the Mediterranean, rather than into what it sees as a backward Balkan past. 
Austria and Hungary also faced the Netherlands, who were humiliated during the Bosnian war in Srebrenica. The Dutch consequently have made a decade-long commitment that they will block any attempts at a Serb EU membership as long as Serbia does not officially acknowledge the Bosnian genocide. So Austria and Hungary will either have to convince the Dutch to give up on that commitment or somehow convince the Serbs to do some rather difficult historical self-reflection. And we have not even mentioned the difficult issues of Kosovo. But the often ignored main challenge in all of this is to convince the Serbs to join the EU. Hostility towards the European Union does exist. Serbia is also not exactly a well-functioning democracy, something that Hungary probably doesn't care much about but could embarrass the Austrians and maybe an obstacle to EU membership in general. It is doubtful that many Europeans would want to deal with the prospect of a Serbian version of Viktor Orban in the future. By far the biggest diplomatic challenge, though, is to convince Serbia to let go of its other friend, Russia, and to convince them that there is a much brighter and better future in making its neighbours, Austria, Slovakia, Hungary and Romania, its new best friends. Poland will, without a doubt, block the entry of any Russian friends into the European Union. The main carrot that they like to dangle before Serbia is the prospect of economic development. Austrian diplomats love reminding Serbs that Belgrade used to be a big center of machine production. Tractors made in Belgrade were sold from India to Egypt and they could even compete and be sold in the West. And as mentioned before, the Yugo, a car produced in Belgrade, was pretty much the only communist car that was actually decent and the only one good enough to be exported to and compete in the West. And recent developments will bring this conversation back into the forefront. A Ukrainian and Moldovan EU membership will require the development of infrastructure to integrate these countries into Europe. Poland is already busy making plans for railroad networks that tie Ukraine deeper into Poland. And rail is generally one of the best systems of transportation infrastructure you can have. Austria and Hungary recently also spent billions building a direct rail connection from Bucharest through the Carpathians into Budapest and Vienna, integrating Romania deeper into Europe and circumventing the Danube. But as much as you may like railroads, and I love and advocate for railroads too, since it obviously just makes sense. But despite how amazing they are, they do not beat rivers as a means of transporting goods. The tonnage you can transport via river barges and ships will always outmatch what you can transport by rail. There is no technology invented yet that could even come close to enabling the sheer mass of goods you can transport on water. A reason why railroad infrastructure is underdeveloped in the United States, for example, is that the Mississippi River network makes rail unnecessary as a means of transporting goods. The best thing about a river is that it is the cheapest infrastructure there is. You do not need to build a river. You do not need electricity or diesel to run a river. You do not need enormous maintenance costs to maintain a river. A river just is. All you can do is neglect a river. And that neglect is exactly what happened to the Danube for a century. The most important transportation artery of Ukrainian goods is the Dnipro River. Poland's railroads will without a doubt tie Ukraine culturally, politically and economically deeper together with Poland. But the vast bulk of Ukrainian goods will continue to flow down the Dnipro River into the Black Sea. Moldova has a difficult geography that separates it from Romania through the Carpathians and separates it from Ukraine through a Russian shenanigan puppet statelet. But it does still have access to the Danube. And even though Georgia's EU membership is still a distant prospect, if it were ever to be, and since it has many backers in Europe, Georgia would almost certainly be a sort of EU enclave that is physically separated from the European Union landmass. The only means that can tie Georgia into Europe is through crossing the Black Sea. Developing the Danube as a means of transportation may become a necessity to further the political and cultural integration of these countries in the first place. In an ironic twist, even though some in the European Union may have liked to ignore Serbia in favor of expanding into Ukraine, the Ukrainian membership may make the Serbian membership a necessity. I like discussing this topic. It is an often ignored and overlooked part of Europe, and it invites people to discuss and examine how we may view and interpret aspects of modern politics. 
If you are someone who emphasizes the role of geography in political development, you will likely point out that despite being ignored throughout the Cold War, the Danube has still retained its importance and that a return to its use merely constitutes a political return to using a naturally advantageous geographic outlook. Or you could say that the neglect of the Danube is within itself evidence of the political nature behind the decision-making process regarding a geography in the first place. And it is also interesting regarding the future of European politics. An unintentional side effect of the 2008 Euro crisis was the creation of regional political blocs. While all members of the European Union cooperate, some cooperate more than others. Bound together either by culture, geography or policy, we see regional cooperation increasingly intensify in the framework of wider cooperation. Put the Polish and the Italian conservative into one room and they probably will not agree on much at all. Put a Dutch conservative and a Swedish social democrat into a room and they will agree on far more. I believe and predict that European politics throughout the next century will see these regional groups becoming a more important and core component of European politics, and that to gain insights into the future of European political developments, one should recognize and study these groups. Northern Europe, bound together by culture and policy of Protestant fiscal conservatism mixed with Scandinavian social democracy. Visegrad, which one could also call scared of Russia Europe, which is bound together by Slavic culture, the historic experience of post-communism and common strategic interests in defense. The Mediterranean, a project that admittedly is still under construction, mainly driven by France to bind Mediterranean European countries closer together in economic cooperation and defense across cultures. And Danubia, mainly driven by Austria and Hungary to fully develop the Danube as a European economic core that can keep up with the Rhine Valley, with some outliers like Ireland, Hungary, Slovakia, Portugal and Estonia. Ireland is profiting from Brexit by increasingly taking over Britain's former role of being America's partner in the European Union. Ireland would probably much rather be part of an entirely separate bloc of countries in the European Union, bound together by a common outward-looking geography of the North Atlantic coast, which one could call the Atlantic coast. But with neither Britain, Iceland nor Norway in the European Union, this is currently not an option for them. Hungary and Slovakia are founders of the Visegrad group and would probably like to see their European political future as the bridges between Danubia and Visegrad. But Hungary has recently severely damaged its relationship with the other founders of Visegrad by flirting far too much with Russia, while Slovakia enjoys having cozy relationships with both Poland and Austria. Hungary and Slovakia could go either way or stay with both. Portugal is a very outward-looking country. Separated by geography of mountains from the European mainland, the Portuguese have historically always sought out conquests, markets and friends abroad. Portuguese politicians like to advocate for visa-free travel between South America and the European Union. Portugal may pursue a role as part of the Mediterranean, but through its geography is more tempted into a similar position as Ireland. Portugal would, like Ireland, enjoy being a bridge for outsiders into Europe. Estonia was historically heavily influenced by Scandinavian Lutheranism. Estonia may be majority non-religious today and may have spent centuries under a Russian rule, but the foundations of its political and cultural institutions were heavily influenced by Scandinavia. Estonia is heavily investing into transportation and cooperation with Finland. It would like to shed its Eastern European legacy as something that was part of an unwanted Russian yoke, but still would like to keep its ties to Poland. The Baltic states in general, but in particular Estonia, could join both with Visegrad and Northern Europe or be its own thing, as a Baltic group acting as a bridge between the North and Visegrad. Of course, I am not arguing that these groups are limits or borders set in stone. One of my favorite maps is this map of France, which correlates with two factors in cuisine and the French language. People who live here cook with olive oil, while sometimes insulting those who live there by calling them Germans. While those who live here cook with butter, and sometimes insult those who live there by calling them Italians. Which reminds me a lot about living in Transdanubia and Barbaria. Cultural, lingual and many other divisions of Europe have always been factors in continuous flux. But I do believe that the groups I have listed in this video are crystallizing themselves out to be a core factor in future European politics. 
for those viewers in the audience who are from countries that you would like to see joining the European Union in the near future, it may be worth examining which one of these inner European groups would serve your country's interest best to join. Thank you to Crossout for sponsoring this video.